great time. Hallelujah. Well, first I want to start off this morning with a whole lot of grace and tell all y'all men and fathers, God loves you. He does. And he loves you because he knows your heart of hearts. See, he knows that we've done the best we know how and knew how at the time. How many of us would say, I wish I knew then what I know now? Yeah. But God, our Father, knows the inner man. And I'm going to give you a new concept today. The new concept is this. I call it retroactive blessings of grace. <laughs> retroactive blessings of grace are for all of us who are acknowledging who we are, the way it's been, admitting we've done the best we could, but knowing that God knows our hearts and where he's taking us. Retroactive blessings of grace says, I will quicken you now in spite of shortfalls in the past, in spite of it. And we're talking about that relationship with our father, relationships with one another, with children, with extended family. Those take a little work, don't they? But you can understand that a heart confessed to God, acknowledging things from the past. If we only knew then what we know now. God knows that. And when we say that, when we say that kind of a thing to God, he quickens you. He quickens you. And don't be surprised if that blessing gets extended from those who have been part of your past. Yeah. What I love about it is I can say that. I didn't make that up. The phrase I did, but I can say that based on Hebrews chapter 12. And if you're quick on the draw, you could go there to verse 9. It says this, we had earthly fathers to discipline us. Now, before I go any further, a lot of your translations use the word discipline in different ways. Chastisement, training, discipline. I guess it's just kind of the, uh, you know, the, 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 um, what those translators felt were, was a word that would describe it. But you got to go to the original language to get it. And uh, this word discipline is a word, pedutes is the word, it means trainer, it means teacher, it means nurturer, okay? So let's hear that. We had earthly fathers to discipline us, to train us, teach us, and nurture us, and we respected them. For they, that's dads, disciplined us. Now, this second word is not the same as the first word. It's the word peduo. Pedutes, peduo. Say, well, well they're pretty, pretty similar. I'm telling you, one letter makes a big difference. Just think of the word the, theist and take an A and put it in front of the word theist. You have atheist. Is there a difference there? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And so these two words are really different. It means, peduo means training and discipline in order to conform us to truth, which means sometimes there may be a little pain. Now I'm talking about your kid. That was a joke, you know. <laughs> Woo, too serious here. We need some more donuts. There may be a little pain, for they disciplined us, that's the first word, as they saw best. For a short time, as seemed best to them. I know we had no training, Linda and I, in what a Christian family was. We're first-generation born-again people. So we had no frame of reference, no Christian home. 
So you know how we uh, trained our children as they came along? Because we were children raising children. We read Dare to Discipline. <laughs> we read Strong Will Child. We read books. And we watched people in our churches that we attended. We did what we felt was best. But it ends here. But he, that's God, disciplines us. And that's peduo again. Training, disciplining. Maybe there's some pain in it for our good that we may share his holiness. You know, the things we go through in life, we like to trust that as we're training, nurturing, teaching our children, that they would walk a holier life, right? Well, regardless of how we've done it or not done it, God makes the difference. And everything you go through as you were raising your children, as you as a child were being raised, was to help you one day share in the holiness of God. Hey, I remember a certain sigh in the congregation. It was kind of a lament with bated breath when I began our Mother's Day sermon in 1 Peter and said we we're going to highlight submission. Ugh, submission. But I trust that by the end of the, the sermon, everyone realized the beauty and Christ-likeness of a woman's gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the eyes of God. Today, fathers, dads, men, I'd like us to consider how the Spirit of God challenges us to be real men. Hmm? Now, that begins our time with 1 Corinthians 16, so turn there. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14. And as you're turning, I'm going to ask the Lord to continue blessing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Uh, we would be foolish thinking we really know what we're talking about. <laughs> Only you know. And we're trying to discover. So thank you for your grace, which is so wonderful, so freeing. Even when we deal with consequences, your grace helps us to walk through it victoriously. So Lord, as we go into these numerous scriptures we have today, May your spirit train us, teach us, nurture us, because you are our heavenly Father. Thank you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. 1 Corinthians 16, beginning at verse 13, says this, Be on the alert. Stand firm in faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now, the first four, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, and be strong, they seem specific, but actually they are general. They're general in nature. And the fifth one, the fifth phrase, let all that you do be done in love, seems general, but it's very specific. Love is the core action and attitude for men and fathers to be lived out. And today, I hope we can see it lived out in three words, roles, relationships, and rewards. Well, we men, we need to get used to the word love. Love is a powerful word. And love is the only thing that the enemy cannot counterfeit. So if you're a lover, men, a lover, you love people, 
You love everything God has given you. There's great things in store for you and for the people that he's given you. So let's start with the word roles. And I'm talking to men because not everyone in this room is married and some, um, not everyone's a father who's married. And even we have grandfathers here. Let's accept that a man's first role as a father is to be the most significant, the most significant teacher, tutor, trainer, nurturer, imparter, encourager, you say, you name it. Our fathers, earthly fathers, are the number one influencers in the family. Number one, yes, there's a lot of influences that are going to come across our children's lives, but men, you are numero uno. You are the supreme. You are primo. And this role goes beyond biology. We're not just talking about biology, because just because a man can father a child biologically doesn't mean they're a man in the sense of a spiritual man, what God intends. It's our spiritual role of influencing their eternal life. You know, every human being conceived will live forever. Every human being conceived lives forever. <laughs> and just a footnote, I truly believe, based on Scripture, that those that don't see the light of day are with the Lord. Are with the Lord. So, our role as father goes beyond biology in this life. It's our spiritual role influencing their eternal life. Paul understood this, and here's your first scripture that's even in the bulletin, 1 Corinthians 4.15. He understood this when he said this, For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. I exhort you, therefore, be imitators of me. Now, obviously, he's talking spiritually, isn't he? He's this a metaphor. I, I have become your father. There's a lot of tutors. Look, if you're conscious, everyone you're in the presence of, everyone you see is teaching you something. They're tutoring you what to do or what not to do. They're influencing. But as he's talking to the Corinthian believers here, he's saying, but you don't have a spiritual father. He brought the gospel to them. They received it. It's like he begat them. Spiritual birth. I'm your father. He says, I exhort you there, be imitators of me. See, the best fathering, the best fathering occurs when we demonstrate the living gospel of Jesus Christ. You want to know how the father men? Watch Jesus. Not only that, watch how Jesus related to his father. Because we were all youngins once, weren't we? And how we related to our parents is what it is. But you look at Jesus and you can see the, oh, okay, I need to be quickened in this. But you see how the father responded to his son. What a relationship. The best fathering occurs when we demonstrate the living gospel of Jesus Christ. The best imitating occurs as our children realize that we are dependent on our wallets. Nope. 
how we are dependent on our brain. Nope. On our skills. Nope. As we are dependent on the Lord. We're dependent on the Lord. Listen to Psalm 127. This was a psalm that Linda and I memorized as we were learning to raise our children. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen keep watch. They keep awake in vain. Men, it's not the school systems. It's not Sunday school, church school. It's not friends. It's not government. But it's our triune God. Do you know our triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, our triune God is the master builder who employs you? (laughs) God employs men and fathers to do what? to work alongside him, to observe. When I learned the trade, I was a 32-year-old apprentice. I was apprenticed to a 19-year-old journeyman. He was a wise guy. One time they told me to go find in the tool shed some sky hooks. trying to, you know, do a number on me. It was humbling. But I watched this young man. He knew his stuff. He grew up with his dad as a contractor, so on and so forth. He knew his stuff. And I learned. I learned. And I worked alongside. I worked alongside. And I guess I was learned enough to be dangerous to build our own house. Still standing after 29 years. (laughs) Something like that. No, it's not society. It's not the police. It's not first responders. It's not it takes a village. It's fathers who are intercessors in prayer, who are warriors, Dads, our disposition is to have moral strength, mental readiness, and the willing responsibility of a warrior. See? Unless the Lord builds the house, I'm dependent on you, Lord. You know, we don't know everything. And our lives were a lot of sorry And the way we raise one and two is different than the way we raise number three and number four and number five and so on and so forth because we were growing along the way. And there was a lot of, I'm I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm sorry. And they'd say, you're sorry. (laughs) No, they didn't say that. God wants us to work alongside him. Look at verse 2, still in Psalm 127. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Listen, yeah, we got to do the work, but self-reliance, men, is a recipe for burnout. It's in the multitude of counselors that there's victory. It's okay to say, I don't know if I'm doing this right. And to, you know, come alongside somebody. And nobody's perfect. And no family's perfect. But men, it's okay. It's okay to talk to one another. Look, Uh, Proverbs 24, 6. For by wise guidance you will wage war, and in abundance of counselors there is victory. And uh, by the way, there's a war going on. (laughs) And the war is for the mind and for the soul 
It's just happening. And we've got to be aware. Uh, and, and I love this, that second part of that verse 2, that he gives to his beloved even sleep, even in his sleep. You know, God's grace is rest for your soul. It really is. And it's love to our spirits. I love when it says there in Psalm 46.10, cease striving and know that I am God. We won't be able to do everything we want to do. Hey, let's let God do some of the work. He wants to. Cease striving and know that I am God. You know what that tells me? God has my back. He does. He does. And I want to praise God for a mom who for most of my formative years raised me, single mom and my brother. And my wife and I, we talk about this a lot. I don't have certain insecurities in my life because I knew I was loved by my mom. Now, I wasn't, you know, the angel. Well, I had a par partial halo and a partial horn. So I wasn't all good, but I wasn't all bad either. But I knew I was loved. And, and you know, sometimes you... <laughs> yeah. You know, because moms can get a little soupy. Yeah, dads can too. For he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. I pray that you would know, regardless of how you were raised, men and women for that matter, that our Heavenly Father loves us perfectly. And that you are loved by him. But if you had the benefit of being loved by an earthly parent or an earthly dad, just like John says in 1 John, he says, we love because he first loved us. Wow. And when we have an example of a parent, a dad, who loves their children, loves their family, you will extend that love. Because you are loved, you see. But if that didn't happen for you, turn your eyes to the Father. Because he loves you. Remember the Hebrews passage. Even the best father could only do what they thought was best at the time. But our heavenly Father, he does what he does for eternity. Praise you, Lord. So that's the role. How about the relationship? How about the relationship that we can have? The quality of a relationship depends upon genuine love. It does. True love is passionate. How do I know? How do I know if I love some? Well, guys, do you love your cars? Yeah. Do, do you love your, your hobbies? Uh, do you love the stuff that you can't wait to get to, that you have affection for, you actually have affection for? That's a passionate drive. That's genuine. But true relationship within our family depends on genuine love. And that seeks the other's well-being. It asks difficult questions when necessary. You see, the goal of any relationship is edification. It's mutual benefit. It's enduring excellence. That's general relationships. But the goal of true fathering, here's the goal. It's that our children walk worthy of the God who loves them. And even as they see us walking that way ourselves. <laughs> the... Uh, old example I heard once, it's just burned in my mind, about a parent who was trying to help their child not smoke. And they said, I don't ever want to see you smoking. If I catch you with a cigarette in, my, in your hand, 
Yeah, right. <laughs> if it's good for you, Dad, Mom, it's good for me. Okay. Oh, true fathering, that goal, true parenting, is that there's something imparted because they see it going on in you. You can't impart. You can't give away what you don't own. But if I own it, I can give it away. I can impart it. Hear the Holy Spirit in our second scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Go there if you like. Paul was speaking to them. He says, we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. Exhorting, that's, that's strong encouragement. That's like trying to counsel. Encouraging is blessing the things that they do. Imploring, it's like begging. See, it's pretty intense, isn't it? Why? So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. A lot of us say, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. And uh, Bob and I were saying today, how long is old? <laughs> is it old, old, or is it young, old, or what? You know. Now, the truth is, get the word in. <laughs> get the word in, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Yeah. All that exhorting, all that encouraging, all that imploring. <laughs> Sounds like that. But to a listening ear, it realizes all that's going on because my dad or my parent wants me to walk the way God called me. You see, it's positive feedback. It's communication, and positive feedback and communication rule. We need to start thinking more positively. St. Francis of Assisi, he was said to be a very positive individual. And he had his disciples walking by with him when they were on a walk in the country, and they, and they came upon a, a carcass of an animal. And that, and that carcass was just, you know decayed, rotted. And St. Francis looked at it and he said, well, look, he has wonderful teeth. <laughs> he saw something positive. That's the point. We can be long on the problems and short on the solution. <laughs> Let's learn to be a little more positive. Positive feedback and communication rules. How will anyone know how to walk the walk unless they see it in real time? Most people are not influenced by words. They say more is caught than taught. When they see it, they follow. Here, the quality of our relationship depends upon our gratitude. Our gratitude. Back to Psalm 127, verse 3. It says there, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Now, it's a tough but an honest question I'm going to ask you right now. Are your children a burden or a gift? <laughs> yes. Yes. safe. <laughs> you see, how we value the unique person that they are, how we respond to their presence when they're present will determine the quality of our investments 
that they'll receive from us. If I don't value the people I'm with, they don't get a really good investment of me. But if I know that they are a gift, then I'm going to respond in a very invested way, giving of myself. If you didn't know, children are God's gift to bless us, to develop our love, to increase our knowledge and wisdom, and to give us an opportunity for spiritual reproduction. That's really the goal. The reward of the womb is the joy beyond biology for the fulfillment of spiritual reproduction. Jesus, when he called the disciples in John 15, he said to them, you didn't choose me, I chose you to go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. We call that legacy as far as a family goes. We call that what is passed down from generation to generation. The most valuable and tangible rewards are those which endure through time and eternity. Um, you know, I don't really ever plan or use my family as examples, but everyone in my family, even down to the smallest child, knows Jesus. My kids, my grandkids, I don't care what I accomplish on this earth. I want to see them all in heaven. Because, you know, we got 60, 70, 80, even if it were 100 years on this earth, and we win some and we lose some and we do it right and we fall on our face, and but eternity is a long time. <laughs> it sure is. You see, we read in Proverbs uh, 3.22. I'm all over the, the scripture today, if you hadn't noticed. In Proverbs 3.22, this, this was really uh, an interesting verse. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. A dear friend of mine who used to go to this church is with the Lord now. He had an interesting take on this verse. He says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Well, he had an attitude with his kids, so he said, well, I'm only going to leave the inheritance to my grandkids <laughs> because there it is. <laughs> leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Uh, no, I think he sees that a little more correctly right now. It's meaning it gets passed down. And it's nice that we can... Bless those who come after us. That's nice. But ask yourself this question. Will it rust? <laughs> can moths eat it? Uh, can thieves steal it? True wealth that's passed down through generations, that's spiritual riches which never lose value. They never depreciate. They always appreciate. So we've got the role, we've got the relationship, and now the reward. And it's all about love. Ultimately, regardless how we started, men, we all want to finish well. We want to finish well. And fatherhood reaches its high point when children are released into this world and can go forth confidently into the world with an unashamed testimony of who they are and our triune God. That's the high point of fatherhood. Uh, back to Psalm 127. Last two verses we'll look at today. Verse 4, like arrows in the hand of a, of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. 
They shall not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. <laughs> it's a funny word, quiver, because when you have kids, you start quivering. <laughs> but I, I, I don't think that's what it was. <laughs> And a quiver, actually, in those days, you know, was a, a cylindrical-looking thing of about three pounds in weight and could hold anywhere from 20 to 25 arrows. The uh, metaphor here is that arrows are like children. Anybody have 20 to 25 children? It's not a matter of how many children, how many arrows are in our quiver. It's a matter of when they're released into the world, do they have a true flight? Oh, now we have to define that, right? What is a true flight? You know, when they made arrows in those days, they had to be straight. Feathers in ways that when that thing was released, the flight would be true or straight. A true flight for a child is this. Well, let me tell you what it isn't. It isn't that a child never makes a mistake. It's not my children are true, they're good, they never did anything wrong, they're true flying individuals. By the way, there was only one child who grew up to be a man that had a true, perfect flight. Jesus. Right? Here's a true flight. It's their ability to confess when wrong. It's their ability to forgive when wounded. It's to have compassion regardless of others' ingratitude. It's to be loyal even if it means going against the flow. It's to be true to themselves. It's to embrace and live in grace. It's to be content with who God made them to be. That's a true flight. And if we can impart those kind of things into our children, not that they're perfect, not that they never make a mistake. Not that they're little tin soldiers. We are godly. We are godly. We are godly. I've seen it. Maybe you have too. That's not true. That's a tin soldier. Because they're going to face enemies. And whether those enemies are physical or spiritual, what discernment will that child have when they're released? And you may not, you know, parents, you need to release them. <laughs> Only you stay in the quiver. You're 50 years old, stay in the quiver. Uh, no. <laughs> they're going to face enemies. And they're released out there. And their discernment's going to come. It's going to come from the training and life experiences they have been taught, that they have seen, witnessed, demonstrated. Their strength of moral character and love, which covers a multitude of challenges, that's the responses we want to see in people, in our children. And those characteristics of our children will duplicate and be reproduced in them as an unashamed testimony. You see, if you forgive them, they will forgive be forgiving people. If you have grace on them, they will be people who give grace. Okay? They will reproduce what's been given. 
whether they're in schools or colleges or in sports and recreation, whether they're in the employment area or just hanging out, they will reproduce what has been put in. Listen to the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 55, 11. My word, which goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. That's God speaking. He's saying about his word. He's releasing his word. Think about it. God spoke. He spoke his living word. He released his word. And he's saying, what I have said, what I have released is going to accomplish the things that I have addressed. Just as God sent his word into the world, in the same way, God's word needs to sink deep into our children. And it will never return empty. You know why? For his word will accomplish what God has destined in them for his glory. If you live long enough, you see these things. <laughs> and I know we have many amens in the congregation. Coming in for a landing. Proverbs 17, 6 tells us, Grandchildren are the crown of old men. And the glory of sons, and I'm going to add daughters, is their fathers. You see, every one of us in this room has a father. We have been sons and daughters, and those men among us who have been blessed to marry and have children have become fathers. And some of us old men, no, no, older men, are crowned with the glory of having grandchildren. Our Father in heaven desires for us to imitate him. Paul says in Ephesians 5, imitate, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you. We started out with it's all about love. And we're ending in the same place. What are we to be imitators of? Love. Not just men, women, but love is the core action and attitude of godly people. But men, fathers, let's disciple in love. It's great to pass on a skill. It's great to pass on, a, you know, uh, whatever aptitude and talents and skills that you see in your children. But disciple them in love. Because love conquers all. Let's accept our roles, develop our relationships, and delight in our reward. It's the way our Heavenly Father treats us. It's the way our Lord Jesus taught us. Our children, regardless of the age, they could be youngsters or adults with their own families, all children desire their father's encouraging examples. And if today's the day you got to turn over the new leaf, and rather than being a pharaoh, you're going to be a father. And if you're reading the right book, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Kids don't need pharaohs. They need fathers. And regardless, as I said, of age, your kids could be married and have their own kids. They desire encouragement, encouraging examples. And guess what? There's another benefit. Your wives will sleep better. 
And our Father in heaven will smile on you and favor you, and you'll sleep better. <laughs> there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. If today is the first day that you're going to say, I'm going to do it from the way I heard something I heard today, then today is the day of retroactive grace in your life. <laughs> There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So that's it. Happy Father's Day, man. Down there. Thank you, Lord. Oh, you guys are clapping because I finished nine minutes early. I'll get you next week. Uh, by the, again, some came in late. Uh, if you want to be baptized, please see me uh, up here up front uh, at the end of the service. All right. It's a good day, huh? It was fun. Let's stand. Lord, thank you again. Thank you. Uh, we're, all, we're all apprentices, no matter how old we are. We're all learning. We're learning about loving the way you loved us. And whether it's our brothers and sisters in Christ or our brothers and sisters in the home, that we would love one another the way you have loved us, Father. Thank you for the example. Thank you for the instruction. And Lord, we do pray that much grace would flow through this congregation and that there would be healing in this congregation throughout families. And if people haven't heard from their kids or loved ones for a long time, then I pray today's the day that you would put it on the hearts, whether it's prodigals, or just uh, offenses that have caused estrangement. Lord, let today be a day of healing, a day of rejoicing, a day of being free in you. So we're grateful, Lord. Thank you for every man and woman in this place, for our church, and for what you'll continue to do through us. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Father.